I have with me today Max Derrett. If you are interested in any of the things that I am interested in or that I talk about, you will absolutely love this discussion that I have with him. He's a very interesting guy. We talk about all kinds of things from Carl Jung to alchemy to what he studied in school and what games he likes. I mean, this was a really fun discussion, very fascinating. Uh, it's Max Derrett on YouTube. You should all go subscribe to him. And I hope you enjoy the discussion. Thank you for uh, tuning in to the State of the Art podcast. I have with me today Max Derrett. And I'm just going to ask him a few questions about his life and everything about his history and why in the world he decided to study alchemy in the 21st century. So, <laughs> right. Max, mm -hmm. first off, where are you from? I'm from Canada, actually. Canada? What in the world? I didn't know that. Are you on the East Coast? Um, yeah, I, um, I lived in Ontario, which is the southernmost province of Canada Ontario. most of my life. Although I'm actually in the process of trying to... Uh, low-key become an american citizen but uh mm. i don't want to talk too publicly about that because that's sort of a sorry in case people don't know I, I do this anonymously that um you know uh. hence the avatar that's why people have never seen my face although i i have promised people once i get to one million subscribers Ooh. then uh i will be disappointing people in the fact that i'm not in fact a yellow simpsons character so oh man i don't know you could always paint your face or you could you could figure some way to to keep it looking like that but we well, that, you want to you before that Avatar mm -hmm. does kind of represent you more or less, right? That's kind of what you look like a little. Uh, yeah. So, um, well, I, I don't know. Uh, Loki, I had that picture done back mm -hmm. in 2007. So it's been 17 years. Oh, wow. Uh, so the story, in case people don't know, <laughs> is that um, back when the Simpsons movie came out, that was in 2007, there's this website that was done as a promotion for the movie called SimpsonizeMe.com. I uploaded a picture of my actual face to the website, and this was the picture that popped out. And so when I decided to do YouTube, I said to myself, well, I, I'm not sure I want to appear on camera, even though I do have a pretty photogenic visage, but that's just me talking. <laughs> um, I just decided, you know what, I will uh, use this image instead. And so, yeah. Okay, so if anybody is familiar with uh, the ins and outs of how that program worked in 2007, I'll bet you somebody could reverse engineer that image into exactly what you really look like. <laughs> I'll bet you somebody could do it. <laughs> yes, uh, I actually, you know what? I have tried that, and I can say on good authority that I will look like a blonde Brad Pitt. Oh, just... oh wow, how about that? All right, well, hey, we'll all get to figure out pretty soon. Well, okay, you don't have to tell me like exactly what city and what street address you're from, but I do want right. to know a little bit about your background, right? Because sure, sure. I feel like that, uh, you, your, your, your channel is very unique. It is a very unique channel. And I've spent a little bit of time, um, you know, in the past several months um, going through a lot of the content, a lot of your videos. And um, you come up with some pretty fresh takes, I must say, some pretty unique perspectives that are uncommon uh, that I, you know, as somebody who has studied the, these video games, you know, that we talk about, Xenogears and a lot of the mm. games that are like really deep, like Silent Hill 2 and all that stuff, right? Um, you, you are somehow able to take these games that people have been talking about for 25 years and come away with a, a brand new, fresh take that uh, nobody's ever really talked about before. So mm -hmm. what, what is your history like? Like, how, how did you grow up in order to enable you to kind of do what you do here? Uh, two words, weaponized autism. Oh, int okay, interesting. <laughs> yes. You and I, I don't know if you knew this from like going through my video archive, I, but I, I do did, actually yes. have. Okay, yes. I, in case people who are listening to this and don't know anything about me, I do actually have autism. Very and one good. of the symptoms that comes along with that is a tendency to see patterns where other people don't. Okay. I okay. just, when I've been playing these games and it was around 2017, 2018 that I decided that, huh, well... I put out some videos where I analyze games and some people seem to like it. And so I decided to do a little bit more. And by cross-referencing the influences that people behind these games had with the content in the games themselves, I was able to pick up on stuff that they said and stuff in the games and the patterns between them and just say, okay, well, here's the stuff that I noticed and people seem to enjoy them. And I, as far as the original takes thing, yeah, I, I guess that's just something that when I'm doing my research, I do tend to look at what a lot of other people are saying about the stuff. Okay. Uh, just so I make sure that I don't repeat myself or plagiarize other people's works. Um, okay. And, you know, people want to hear original takes, right? They don't want to just hear what other people are saying. So I, I try to seek them out as best I can. 
Do you have any um, like training or education in this kind of stuff? Like, did you? Uh, <laughs> well, actually, no. I mm-hmm. all the stuff that I've learned in all these different fields has been self-taught. And you know, uh, that's yeah. Most of the people that I enjoy listening to on the internets uh, have a similar story. They have not been trained by the uh, the so-called experts. Mm-hmm. It's a it's it's actually an interesting story. So. Yeah. I actually, you were asking me before we started what I went to school for. Um, right. I don't, I don't know. Did you said you were going to take a guess? Do you want to take a guess as to what that was? Oh, geez. I mean, like the 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 what would you call it? The the average person in me wants to say that you went to school for game design, but I'm going to go ahead and just uh, stab at um, philosophy. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I, as a matter of fact, I didn't take a single philosophy course in all of the university. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I went to the first time I went to university. I went there for history, and okay, very cool. the second time I went for audio engineering for uh, uh, content production. Yeah, so that's how you got that silky smooth engineered radio voice. A right, exactly. Okay, so nice. yeah, but I found like the reason why I went into all those things is just because when I was in school, I, I didn't really do anything based off of what I personally was interested in. I, I was just trying to go by what my my parents and my teachers and my elders were saying would be best for my life in the long run. Would, you know, just do the best that you can with the subjects that you um, that you have. Okay. And then take whatever subject that you do the best in and then pursue that. And in my case, that was history and creative endeavors but then when i found that i went to university um you know there's a difference in the way that you learn in uh sec like elementary junior high secondary school compared to post-secondary school right whereas prior to that prior to post-secondary you just get by memorizing a lot of things which is what i did for the majority of my life yeah and then when i went to post-secondary you do nothing at all, and then a week before the test, you start studying, and then you get an A on the test, and that's that, right? Basically, yeah, that, that was, was my life. That was that's, exactly it. Yeah, that was high school yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah, three days. I just spent the three days before the test just yep. memorizing everything in the textbook, and I did just fine. But the problem is, you don't learn anything that way. No, you forget it all after another week. Yeah. So when you go to yeah. university, you're sort of in trouble because you, you have to have the passion. And uh, you need passion in order to have that information really stick. And I found that I really struggled in university as a consequence. So oh, okay, okay. Um, even though I did ultimately graduate from university the second time uh, when I did go for audio engineering, um, it was barely because even though I do have some interest in, you know, audio like and creative media production, uh, it wasn't the stuff that I was working on wasn't something that, like a lot of stuff that I had my heart in. So gotcha. it was mostly in the years following uh, university that I sort of had to pick up the pieces and figure out what I was truly interested in. And I found that by starting a YouTube channel, I uh, put out a, th- there was this little game, I'm pretty sure you might have heard of it, Kaysen, called Inside. It was done by the guys that did another game called Limbo. Maybe you've heard of that one. I, I definitely know Limbo. Yes, yeah. So uh, I I did an analysis video of Inside because I just found the story of that game so interesting. And I felt mm. that there were a lot of things I was picked up on that... Uh, people seem to agree with me with. And I was like, huh, maybe this is something that I have a knack for. And then I just basically, you know, did a whole bunch of other game analyses and now we're here. And now we're here. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of, you, one of the things that I have kind of a hard time figuring out um, from your channel, because you analyze so many different things and you've yeah. got your finger in so many different pots. Um, sometimes it's difficult to know like what, what you like what your opinion is. Like what do you think? Like sure. what's your philosophy on life and and how you approach it? Mm. <laughs> well, maybe that's because uh, I'm trying to look at all these different things and trying to take out the things that I like in order to create my own personal philosophy towards life. Were you were you raised um, religious? That would be one of the yes, things. yes. Yeah. I w- well, I wasn't. I, I went to a Christian school oh, cool. um, for about eight years. Although, I- interestingly enough, <laughs> that was done despite the fact that my mother is agnostic. Okay. Like, she doesn't really believe, but like she's not full on atheist. But gotcha, you know. And then my father, he's not a practicing Catholic. 
he's more of a cultural Catholic, but he, I'm sure he would say he believes in God. Okay. But I suppose they just sent me to a Christian school because they wanted me to to find a way to instill morality into me gotcha. and, uh, gotcha. you know, have that be done in a way that's sort of concordant with Western civilization. Cause a lot of Western civilization, you know, I don't need to tell you is predicated on <laughs> Judeo Christian values and yes, ideas. Of yeah, but yeah. as I found that particularly when I left high school and, uh, I was sort of on this journey of self discovery, I found myself, my interest taking me towards trying to, explain life's biggest questions and that took me to indulging in a whole variety of religious traditions from the mainstream to the esoteric and i found myself uh, drifting away from full-on belief which for the majority of my life i did really believe in you know jesus christ as my savior and the, right. the authenticity of the bible but then i i just found myself i found greater solace in not really adhering to any particular religious practice or any religious community, but just trying to strengthen myself as an individual. I found greater spiritual sustenance in doing that. Uh, I don't know if that answers that That's question. great. No, that's wonderful. Well, what about what about some, um, I don't know, some books or some practices or some, mm. some things that you're able to uh, derive a lot of that meaning from? Sure. So, well, I, I suppose my... I'm greatly, in case it's not obvious, I'm greatly influenced by people like Carl Jung nice. and uh, the Romantic tradition uh, and their interpretation of uh, re religious texts. Because what Jung did with mythology w was so revolutionary uh, and so needed at a time sort of post Nietzsche because a lot of what yeah. Jung's work was was a response to Nietzsche and his right. warnings regarding how Western civilization was going to evolve uh, now that's you know we developed science theory of evolution and how that sort of stuff was going to challenge our fundamental notions of religion and how our society was predicated off of that. Right. And we saw the aftermath of that to some degree and, yeah. you know, the, the bloody wars of the 20th century and people trying to create their own meaning. Yeah. Um, and then Jung comes along and he says, OK, well, maybe what we should do is we should go back to those myths, to those religious traditions and try to see if there was anything of value there that can sustain us. And I found that his journey and his response to Nietzsche was in some way and without going into too much detail, paralleling my own uh, dissatisfaction with or organized Orthodox religion. And yeah. so, yeah, that, that, I guess that's okay. part of why I identify with them so much. So giving you kind of like a new, a new fresh take on something that you already grew up with that was kind of an older thing. Um, that's interesting. So, so was Jung able to kind of help you to reinterpret maybe like Catholicism more specifically? Or maybe, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, tell me about that. Well, well, ca well, well, not just good, not just Christianity, but all mm. the different religions. He right. he was trying to create sort of a unified myth that could sustain uh, Western civilization going into the twenty first and twenty second century. And if uh, you sort of want to get an idea of what Jung was aiming for, it'll take you a while to really understand this book. But I I've talked about it on my channel. It's a book called Ion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You ever. You, you, you ever hear that book? Casey? I've read it. I've read Ion. Oh, yes. God. Yeah, I so can't you know exactly say I totally about. understood it, but I have read it. Yeah, but it's 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 a mind bender, and I'm not oh, even yeah. sure I get the entire thing myself. But well, I tell you what, when he when he brings up the the constellations and um, Pisces and the the new age and Aquarius and all of that, uh, it's it weird. really is mind blowing stuff. And he's saying, yeah. hey, maybe this is all coincidence, but look, it's written in your stars. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's really hard to get. And like at, at first, when he starts talking about stuff like astrology and alchemy and Gnosticism yeah. and all this, and how it links <laughs> into his psychology, it can really go over your head at first. But once you bang your head against that book a little bit, you start to get what he's getting at. Okay, speaking of that, are you um have you read much uh, from the author Ian McGilchrist? Uh, some I, not much, but like I'm obviously okay. aware of who he is. Yeah. Oh man. He's the best. <laughs> when he <laughs> yes, talks yeah, about yeah. the unity of opposites, he's just speaking my language through and through. Um, mm -hmm. And he's another guy kind of in the same space of, of, you know, the things that we are interested in. Of course, he's, you know, he's written books and taught at Cambridge and all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. 
But his whole goal, it seems, is to try to bridge some of this gap, this divide between, between you know, maybe the, um, the, the believers and, and maybe the, the more atheist or the more theistic types of people. And yeah, to saying bridge the that, world of science and the world of value. Yeah. Right, exactly. And, and we're not all that different. I was actually looking, this is just Wikipedia, but I was looking at the Wikipedia page um, a little while ago about the definition of the word secular. And the, the Wikipedia for secularism, it, it's got a line there. I, actually, I copied it down, but it was something like, um, like secularism is essentially like an outgrowth of Protestant Christianity, right? Like it is, you know, basically using the methods of Protestantism to just continue critiquing until es- essentially you've basically, you know, gotten rid of all of the icons and you, it's very iconoclastic. And, um, but it does bring with it a lot of that Christian value structure. And we aren't... You know, we aren't that different, I wouldn't say, that the secular mm. people and the more theistic people um, seem to come to similar um, conclusions via very different routes. Yeah. Some say it's, you know, um, a product of God. Some say it's right. natural. Uh, yeah. yeah. What do you say? Uh, makes sense. Yeah. 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 What do you say? Uh, if it's a product of God or not. Yeah. Um, what are these? I don't know, man. <laughs> what, what would, how would you define God? That's a question. I've, gosh, I mean, oh. <laughs> maybe that's too big of a question. <laughs> it depends on which, how, what you mean by God, Kason. Um, um, the the no. cause for which the effect is the known universe. Yeah, I... <laughs> All right. I want to answer the question. I, I just don't know how. I know. I, that's, that's, basically that's the thing. <laughs> horribly unfair question to even ask. Yeah. Um, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> how about... It's, I understand the interest because trust me, I have people in my comment section all the time asking me what my exact thoughts are. And trust me, I want to answer them. Well, And but, I know that yeah. people who watch this video are going to want, will want, have wanted me to ask you that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. But, hey guys, when I, once I figure out a way to address the question adequately, I promise you, I'll give you an answer. Uh, when you attach, there's a lot of baggage that comes attached to the word God, and a lot of people yeah. are going to think you mean one thing or not. In fact, Carl Jung himself what was it? In, in an interview in 1960, maybe 1962. It was pretty late in his life. Um, the interviewer asked him directly, "Do you believe in God?" And I know Carl what interview Jung, you're talking about. Yeah. And yeah. What did he say? He looked he the say? guy right in the eye and said, "I don't believe. I know that there's a God." And then he yeah. kind of sits back and, you know, he's very smug about the whole thing. That was Carl Jung's style. Um, <laughs> Did you believe in God? Oh, yes. Do you now believe in God? Uh, now? Difficult to answer. I know. I, need, I don't need to believe. I know. <laughs> but after that interview aired, um, a lot of people would talk to him about it and say, oh, my gosh, you believe in my God. <laughs> right, he, exactly. He yeah. had to kind of backtrack a little bit and say, well, well, hold on, hold on. Can I define God a little bit differently than you do, maybe? Of course, we all have our own different definitions. Yeah, yeah. And that's the problem. Like, I don't, when people ask me, do I believe in God? It's like, do you mean, do I believe in the Christian God? Uh, right. Well, if you want to ask me that question, I could probably say no. Like, okay. I don't believe in the benev- like the purely benevolent conception of the Christian God. Gotcha. Um, that, I think that's an easy enough question to ask, but do I believe there is a God or some sort of intelligent design or I, I don't know, is there a, uh, unconscious monad from which all of reality emanates? Um, we could discuss all those different things, but I, I the honest answer is I don't know. And I think it would be better if we just, uh, hash out the merits of all these different arguments instead of me just coming down on one side and you know creating a lot of controversy like yeah. Jung did. And that is the honest answer is that you don't know. And I think that if we're all being honest with ourselves, that's probably we would come to some degree around that same place that we don't really right. know, right? Even if even if you can define God as like I did earlier as the the cause for which the effect is the known universe. Like okay, if we're gonna take causality seriously, there. If the there there had to be a cause for the Big Bang, otherwise causality ends and it doesn't make sense. Um, right. Or maybe it's something like, um, oh, <laughs> you know, I respect to. 
are, we, I, getting, are we getting to, too controversial? No, no, no. I, no, no, no. I was about to say, uh, there's a certain game that you guys covered recently where Ooh. a universe is created. And uh, I was about to say, well, maybe it's something like that. But I don't want to say what game it is because that's a huge I spoiler. know, I know. That's been the... But, okay, so, okay, well, what's your opinion on that just in general then? About, like, spoilers for games that are 10 years old or... You know, maybe, um, although that one, I guess that one maybe came out a little more recently. Um, but talking about games, some games have these really cool, very important ideas that I'm thinking, mm-hmm. man, I just want to go out and share this with the world. Um, but then I can't really talk about it because nobody's played the game. Right. Um, so what you're asking me is whether or not we should tell people that Darth Vader is Luke's father. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> Too soon. Right. See, I, what no, I've but, learned is even 1977, yeah. it's too soon to talk about it in 2024. Really? Is, people have given you crap for some. Not spoil- that one. No, I'm being you know a little bit of what I'm exaggerating there. But there are certain mm-hmm. there's certain media that is like a hundred years old. You know that is like oh don't spoil the ending. And like when can we talk about this stuff? Like when can we um, actually talk about this stuff? So it there's exceptions to every rule, right? Mm-hmm. Let, let's just get that out of the way. But I think that if 20 or 30 years have passed and the piece of media is popular enough that it's kind of accepted that it's entered the public consciousness, then it's fine. Um, However, I do think that there are one or two pieces of media here or there where the entire identity of that piece of art hinges on that reveal. So that's true. So, for example, the movie The Sixth Sense. Ah. The, the brilliance of that movie rests yeah. on the ending of the movie. Right. So I would never want to spoil the sixth sense for anybody. But like something with regards to Darth Vader, the phrase Luke, well, it's not Luke, I am your father. It's no, I am wow. your father. But, you know, just yes, to be pedantic. It, it um, has become <laughs> it has become Luke, I am your father. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. But, yeah, the like, collective just, unconscious. Hey, all right. So, uh, but yeah, the uh, the phrase has just become so ubiquitous in our culture. It's just like, it's not even a spoiler anymore. Everybody knows. So, gen- yeah, to reiterate, generally speaking, I think it's fine after two or three decades have passed. Two or three um, decades. That's a good rule. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but if it's like within the last decade or so, I, I tend to be a little bit more cautious. You know what's but funny? But then there are exceptions. You, yeah. When you bring that up, that's very interesting. Talking about specifically... There is some media where the entire point of the experience is has to be the entire experience has to be entered into not knowing how it's going to end. Right. Otherwise, you lose a lot of the meaning of the entire experience. Mm-hmm. That I don't know. That just kind of that almost sums up storytelling just in general. Like the reason we tell stories, right? There's information you can just give to people. You can just tell people the the moral or the theme or whatever. You can sum it up in five sentences and, oh, now I don't need to hear the story. Now I don't need to watch the movie. Now I don't need to play the game myself. You just told me what it's all about. Or you just summarized, you know, the the, the main principle of the game. So now, like, I'm good, right? But right. there's something about experiencing this stuff in a story. You know, you can never do... There are certain things, not everything, but there are certain things that can only be done justice via story. Right. You know, I'm thinking There's about... A, oh, you go first. Yeah. Do there, you remember what Morpheus said to Neo? I, some of it. <laughs> Which one? <All> right. <laughs> There's a difference between knowing the path and walking it. There. That's beautiful. Right. There's so the, difference path, the between... way of ex- experience versus the way of just superfluous knowledge or, I guess, yes, exactly. surface level knowledge. You know, there's a difference between to go back to the whole discussion of Jung and alchemy. Yeah. Um, you, you, you've heard this... Um, phrase a lot from young and that uh that which you most require will be found in the place that you least want to look uh yes i'm sure that you know just as i know that the truth of that statement in both of our lives absolutely but there's a difference between knowing it and actually actively doing it that's been so i have four kids (laughs) yeah that's actually been probably the hardest thing about raising children just in general is that they have to experience life my job as a parent is sometimes I sometimes I interpret it as <laughs> like I'm I sometimes end up keeping them from experiencing life and totally mm. unintentional. I'm not trying to do this um, or maybe they need to go through hard times, but I'm not going to be the one to put them into these hard situations. Right. Then they'll just resent me. That's not OK. Uh, mm-hmm. But they need to go through it. What do I do? <laughs> like it's it's uh, it's probably the most challenging thing about being a parent. 
uh, knowing yeah. that these kids have to experience this stuff. I can tell them till I'm blue in the face. It doesn't matter. One of my sons, the way he learns, he just, he has to put his hand on the stove. Yeah. He, he yeah. can't just listen to a rule and then just go do it. He, he has to disobey. He has to. And then he learns by experience. And you know what? It may be a trouble for him right now, <laughs> but that, that may serve him well in the future. That's the kind yeah. of thing. He's the kind of person who, what well, he would be a sensate, I guess you could say. <laughs> right. Yes. Good call. So another thing that I was thinking about too, somebody told me this a while ago, but if you're trying to describe a person to somebody, you would first maybe say their name or like what they look like, right? But if you're explaining this, like if I'm telling you about Mike or something and you never met him before, uh, like you're not going to have any idea about Mike, right? And I'm going to have to, okay, well, well, okay, well, then he's, he's this old and, you know, this is some of like personal details and whatever. Here's where he works and all that stuff. At some point, you're just going to be like, okay, you can tell me all of that stuff. I, I have no idea who Mike is, right? Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I would resort to before saying, ah, you just have to meet him, right? The last thing yeah. I would resort to is I would tell a story about him. I'd say, well, he's the kind of guy who, for example, once upon a time back 20 years ago when such and such happened, uh, he made this decision. And that would give you a clue better than anything else that I've said up to this point. That would give you a better clue as to who Mike is than all of the other stuff that I was, his eye color, any of the other stuff that I was telling you, right? And, and telling a story about him. But I wouldn't have been able to sum up that story just using a few sentences. You have to hear the story. But even yeah. that isn't completely adequate. At some point, I'm going to say, ah, you, you just have to meet him, I guess. Like, yeah. there's no substitute for experience. Yeah, I, I, generally, I generally agree. Although, you know, there, there are certain uh, <laughs> things that you can do to sort of weed out the bad apples. I found this funny oh, uh, meme on, uh, on Twitter a couple days ago, where it's, <laughs> it's the basic premise of the meme was uh, to try and find out if uh, the person that uh, you're about to hang out with is uh, a good person or not. And it's, it's a joke related to Final Fantasy. And okay. the person asks the other person in this meme, how do you pronounce the protagonist of uh, Final Fantasy X? Oh, and no. Then... <laughs> <laughs> you're a right. bad person. Right, you know yeah, yeah. And if, <laughs> yeah. If you say Titus, they're like, okay, I, I, I'm gone. Uh, have a good day or something to that effect. Yeah, yeah. Well, I played the game in Japanese when I played it first. And yeah. far as I knew, it was just, it's Tida, Tida. Like, I just, that was how I would always have said Tida. Right, but that's the Japanese, man. I know, like, I know. <laughs> if you read the word, if I just read the word without any foreknowledge, it's, it's Titus. It's obviously Titus. And the word tide, I mean, it like, it all comes together, you know? Mm -hmm. But if I hadn't played in Japanese first, ugh. I'd be right there with you. So even during the podcast, Mike would be saying Titus and I'd be saying Titus. <laughs> so, oh, you know, so, I, I, that's funny. funny I, about that name. <laughs> I, I haven't listened to that one yet, though. That, I got to get around to that. Oh, I just it's, finished it's a your, fun um, one. What was the, I'm just about to finish your Xenosaga series. Oh, very nice. That's good. Yeah, We're yeah. going to start that up soon, too, with the sequel. Soon. Hey, nice. nice. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I'm joking, by the way, about the... the Tight, the tightest thing. Although, if you do say that uh, Cloud should have ended up with Aerith, then you and I oh, have words. Oh, see, there you go. <laughs> that's, that's uh, what would you call it? That's like a death Fighting sentence, words. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, sorry. one of the big things I wanted to ask you, just in general, is how, how in the world you got into alchemy. Why you got into alchemy. Why you got so into alchemy. What use you could possibly find in an ancient system like alchemy. Um, and really just the whole history as to your relationship with alchemy and how you got into it. Well, going back to what you were saying before about trying to reconcile the world of science with the world of value. Right. It seems to me that that's what the alchemists were trying to do. Yeah. Now, whether or not there's any utility to that, who knows? I, I just sort of investigate the subject with the curiosity that maybe it might lead somewhere and that the alchemists were onto something. I mean, if you, even if people say, like, they have a lot of skepticism about that, fair enough, I get it. But to that thing that I just said before, that thing that Carl Jung said about finding the thing that you really need in the place that you least want to look, that's an alchemical dictum. Oh, you know, very the, nice. Yeah, I, that's I don't know right. Go that to case. the center of the earth, and there you will find the stone, something like that, right? It's, no, it's, um, it's, so the, actual alchemical phrase in latin is instraquilinus invenitor 
Uh, and directly translated, it means in filth it will be found. Oh, there you and, go. Okay, I was thinking of a different one. The lapis. Okay, that's right, crazy. Right, right. Okay, in filth it will be found. Right. So wow, that that's a piece of philosophy that comes from alchemy, and I find like so often in my life I found that to be the absolute truth. Well, I think so. So I think so. It's the it's the again it's just going it's the attempt to try and see if there is an inherent link between the world of science and the world of value in the same way that there is a link between mind and matter right okay there you right. go yeah the alchemists were particularly interested in the concept of void and the way it was used to create the cosmos as well as their concoctions mm. as you know at least in regards to the preparation of the Philosopher's Stone, what you need to do, the first ingredient that you need is a piece of the void, that what they would call the prima materia, the, the right. first matter yeah. of the alchemists. And then from that, that pure piece of void, you create the perfect piece of matter in the Philosopher's Stone. One way that the Romantics and people like Jung were trying to combine the world of science and value through this process of alchemy is trying to link the conception of void with that of the human mind okay. right so what is mind and what is the void it's this place from where all of it's within it is the entire potential of existence as well as all the entire potential of what the mind can conjure up Okay. So that's the world, that's the exterior world of objective, like objective material reality trying to mirror the internal subjective world. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. that was an insight of the alchemist and that was an insight of Jung. Is that true? Maybe, maybe not. Hmm. Now, if you're on the side of, well, okay, let's pursue this idea further. What other parallels are there between our internal world and the external world. That's what I think the alchemists were trying to do. That's why they use so much, like using things like the metals in order to symbolize internal processes. Like, um, I, I don't know, maybe we can, oh, okay, here's a good example. Mm -hmm. So you it's, going back to Xenosaga, um, the whole process of Nigrido, Albedo, and Rubido, yeah. right? Nigrido corresponds to that internal uh, void the internal blackness of the mind and the right. exterior void, right? Yeah. That's the, the first state. And then in order to get to the uh, the third stage, uh, albedo, you have to go to the second stage first, which is um, albedo, right? And albedo is the dawning of consciousness. Um, right. That's the whiting. That's, you know, white represents consciousness, yeah. white represents order. And then that crystallizes into this... Um, into the red philosopher's stone. Now, obviously that's right. not an actual physical process, but the alchemists, what they were trying to do is try to expand upon that process to see if there is some way that they cre create a process that was congruent between what was happening within and what was happening without from reality and the mind that the soul or whatever you want to call it. Now, is any of that valid? Prob maybe, maybe not. Uh, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that a lot of the stuff that they were up to back in the day was probably not true and science completely obliterated it and rightly so. <laughs> but I don't think that it's completely out of bounds to suggest that there is a way that the exterior world can mirror the interior world because yeah. a lot of the stuff that Jung was up to resonated with people enough that it has made its way into various works of creative fiction you know just yeah. to mention xenosaga silent hill and this is just talking about video games um yeah. and a couple others that i probably can't remember off the top of my head i, I know that was a very complex answer probably didn't make any sense but no that's i like it i can do okay. no, I, I like that um gosh that's almost like uh it, we talk about in planescape torment like the concept of belief right like it has to happen here first and then it happens outside of here right in the real world um yeah. you can you can make it happen i guess or people around you can make it happen or you can be an instrument in this whole massive process that is um you know doing something that uh, you're just like a little part of it but without you it wouldn't have happened oh yeah uh we also talked about in the planescape torment um video uh 
we talked about like the the way that um, um, an organism is something of a, a collection of its environment, right? That you can know about the environment of the organism um, mm -hmm. through studying the organism itself. Um, so there's a way that a, an individual or a being is a microcosm and to the, to the degree that your mind is adapted to your environment, um, then your mind is, is not only made of the environment, but it's also tuned to, um, you know, to survive within the environment. Um, and there, there's got to be a link. I mean, it's more or less what I'm saying. There's got to be like some way in which, uh, are the mirror, you know, the way that we are, and the way that the outside world is, that they kind of coincide and that they kind of mesh a little bit. Now, there's an obvious way that they don't, which is true as well. Um, but there's got to be some ways, of course, that, that we're similar, you know, that, that the, the, the person is like a little universe and that you've got these creative processes going in your mind, almost like we're like a multiverse because you can like yeah. create. You can create things and then, and then destroy them in your mind before ever manifesting them in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, infinity times. That's a hermetic principle, what you're getting at. Ooh, there we go. Uh, were there hermeticists onto something or were they not? I don't know. Don't know. Do you have an mm -hmm. opinion? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, not one that I'm willing to uh, gotcha. put like public faith in. No. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what's your process then, Max, for um, when you choose, like what, how do you choose what game you're going to talk about? Sure. Like, are you playing tons of games all the time or? Oh God. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> okay. dude. Okay. So at, let, let me see at the moment, what have I got going on? Yeah. Uh, next week I have a video coming out on Hollow Knight. Oh, um, Hollow Knight. Hey, very I'll... fun. Yes. Yes. And then I just finished going through a game called Lisa the Painful, which is a very disturbing game, uh, indie game. Um, and I'm sure people recommended it to me because of my tendency to talk about uh, very dark subjects particularly games like silent hill okay. um and then i'm also going through final fantasy tactics actively at the moment for the first Ooh. time and shout out to mike for his guide on uh, yeah. how to get into that game it saved me a lot of time and frustration <laughs> and then um what else have i got going on oh my wife and i are currently going through final fantasy 7 rebirth and then i feel like there's one other one that uh oh and i'm constantly playing persona 3 all the time just to see just all the time uh, sorry all the time? Well, just when I have an hour free where I could just turn my brain off and not do anything, that's when I'm playing Persona 3, yeah. Persona and then, 3, okay. Yeah, and then um, in the coming weeks, I plan on doing videos on Nier Automata again. And um, what's the next one? Oh, I'm, well, actually, you know what? I don't want to say any more because I want to keep it a surprise. But, but yeah, needless to say, I am constantly trying to play games all the time. Yeah. And the games that I play are ones that are often recommended to me by my audience. So they're a constant source of uh, reliable information. People are like, well, Max, if you love Silent Hill or if you love yeah. Metal Gear or if you love Nier, then you absolutely have to play such and such a game. And without fail, people have constantly recommended me the the best games to do videos on and oh, i just i have a list of recommended games that people have recommended to me it's like 200 games long and then i just i look at the list and then i try to determine okay um how long is this going to take me and then i go to this website called howlongtobeat.com yes, to see I've how long many times yeah yes to figure out how long uh yeah. this game will take me and if i could fit it in alongside maybe where i'm playing another longer game um so I could do a long game and a short game at, a, at the same time. And then, yeah, just try to pick and choose that way. And then, yeah, it's worked out for me for the last little while. It can be a little bit um, uh, overstimulating. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, I said before that I have autism and uh, it can drain me from time to time. But, you know, it's it's rewarding and people love it. And, at you know, at the end of the day, I get to talk about games and I love it. That That's so, so. fun. Uh, Persona 3, by the way, isn't that getting remade or something like that? It got remade, man. It's out. Already happened? Holy cow. Yeah, that was this year, though, back right? in February. Yes, sir. Oh, man. See, I've not played yeah. 3. I've played 4 and 5, but I have not played yeah. 3. Yeah, same. Yeah, I, um, I could say, even though it's not as, like, 5 is, like, a top 20 game for me. Oh, yeah. Um, it's not as good as 5, but it's pretty damn good, and I've already put, like, 60 hours into it. So. Oh, holy cow. <laughs> the yeah, the yeah. new one? Yeah, the new one, the new oh, one. Yeah. That's crazy. And then the whole, just the way that Persona kind of links up with a lot of Carl Jung's 
you know, stuff. Mm. I mean, that's oh, always, yeah, of course. That's just fun. Yeah. That's like gold right there, you know. Have you ever played any of the uh, Shin Megami Tensei games? Um, I we played a little bit of it. Um, of one of them, I can't remember which one, a while ago. But I only played maybe the first two or three hours. And no, I have not actually gotten into them very much. I want to though, right? Um, but I haven't, dude. That that yeah. <laughs> that uh, of any game like playing the Shin Megami Tensei games, you would feel like you had died and gone to heaven. It's really, just, it's <laughs> it's like drugs for people like you and I. It, <laughs> everything they do, like e- e- <clears throat> like obviously Persona is primarily predicated on Jung and his conceptions of psychology and mythology. Yeah, but man, <clears throat> it, it that influence extends to all these other games i've, I've done um uh videos on digital devil saga and shin Megami tensei 3 nocturne and it's omnipresent and it is just it's just like i'm i <laughs> it, it was a, an absolutely delightful week when i worked on both of those games oh that's awesome yeah. see i think i played it in like 2016 or something it was before i had really gotten into a lot of this stuff mm-hmm. but i had graduated college yeah carl Jung came in like waves for me like i Got into him at different times, and, and that, but I only really got super like crazy into him when we were doing our Xeno Gears um, podcast. Yeah, and then there was no going back. And no going back. I read like <laughs> almost all of his works after that. Everything I could get my hands on. All of okay, so you, like you've read like Mysterium Conjunctionis. Yes, and... I have. I have read Mysterium Conjunctionis, but in order to get into that one, you have to first read an introduction to alchemy, which I think it's called an introduction to alchemy, or yeah. Um, uh, the psychology of alchemy, something like that. You got to read that one first, and then Mysterium Conjunctionis still won't make sense. But it's, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Ion. But Those two books, right. Mysterium Conjunctionis and Ion, are like ah. I just I wish I could jump into his mind and know exactly what he was thinking. Yeah, how the hell he came up with all this? Stuff? Well, I mean, you can figure it out. It's called the Red Book, but that's, oh, gosh. that's another. Yeah, who wants to go through thing. that though? That's, yeah, right. Exactly. That's that's his life, you know. Like, mm-hmm. this is one, one of the craziest things to me, too. Um, like, Carl Jung, when you read the Red Book and you figure out, like, what his day-to-day life was like, it's like, man, are you sure you want to be, you sure you want to go into things the way that he did? You look at Nietzsche, too. You look at, um, you know, his letters between Dionysus and the Crucified, which was kind of alter egos of himself, you know, kind of trying to work out the the world and, and what it all means. And um, but you look at even like Dostoevsky and his, um, oh, what is it? He had, um, uh, the, uh, epilepsy seizures. Or, yeah, he had yeah, epilepsy. Yeah. Um, and how his works, just all of his great works were written after his, he had his first seizure. Uh, but man, like it's, I think that's enough evidence <laughs> on its own to suggest that when it comes to genius, there has to be some degree of madness, right? There has to be something wrong with you, you know, like yeah. wrong. I say that in you know, a typical sense, yeah. but. <laughs> But, like, you, you can't just be a normal guy who, you know, lives a normal life and, and produce that kind of stuff. You, you've got right. to be, you got to be mad. That's, that's what you said. you got to be mad. you got to be on the edge of chaos because <sighs> that's where all of uh, creativity stems Right, exactly. From. Yeah, Tolkien, too. So there's another yeah. example. Gosh, Tolkien, he, he felt like he was going crazy. He, he would hear voices. He, he thought he was becoming schizophrenic, similar to Carl Jung. Um, and Tolkien... He said that he uh, people would come into his thoughts all the time, um, unbidden, and speak to him in dead languages. And it's yeah. just like wow, you know. There was this this um, this like medieval knight, this like seventeenth, sixteenth century knight that would show up and to him all the time, and would just speak to him in these old languages. And that's but then but then Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings, and it's like man, he could not have done that unless he had these horrific experiences, you know. And a lot of that probably mm-hmm. stems back to World War One. But now, uh, <laughs> now speaking of uh, being, uh, I don't think this is the wrong way, but I'm just trying to make a joke here. But speaking of chaos, uh, how did we get on this subject? <laughs> oh gosh, I actually don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. Sometimes I just lament that, like, man, you know, so sometimes you want everything to be perfect with your life, and then other times you kind of want some chaos you know you kind of want to experience or the rough edge of the world you know and uh, mm-hmm. i i often will i often some sometimes i think my mind is breaking too and it's just like hey man you know everybody goes through this stuff but and how many great works of art were done by people you know who would today be considered like weird you know yeah and like well. go away don't 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 get around me Good art isn't normal art. 
Oh, that's for that's for sure. Yeah. Is there anything that you want to talk about, or anything that you want to, uh, anything important that you just want to say to the world? Um. Well, I, I was wondering if I could ask you uh, a question, oh, uh, just as do. somebody who's been a fan of uh, Resident Arc for the past years, ever since yep. I did my Xenogears video and I came across your nice. Xenogears series. I got to ask, is there like a game that you and Mike have been wanting to do forever that would be perfect for your type of analysis, but just for whatever reason, you guys haven't gotten around to it? Yes. <laughs> People are going to laugh, but... It is Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I mean, the it's one. It's got to happen someday. It has to happen someday. But but the the more time goes, the more I wonder. You know, I, I we are going to do it. But you know, there's some pressure behind that game. Sure. Um, <laughs> like I'm sure you can relate. But like if we're gonna do FF7, it has to be perfect. You gotta right? do FF7. Yeah, we've yeah. got to do it right. And there's a ton of preparation that goes into it. And, um, you know, Mike, um, we, we kind of want to ignore a lot of the more recent Final Fantasy VII related content. That's more or less the reason why we haven't done it yet is because um, we don't, for a lot of these games, we'll explore some of the additional content that was created around it. Uh, but for FF7, we really don't want to. <laughs> we kind of just want to keep it in 1997 yeah. and not worry about anything that came afterwards. Um, but that's going to be difficult. It'll disappoint some people. Um, we haven't yet figured out the perfect way to to tackle FF7. Mm -hmm. And and another year goes by, and we still haven't done it. And I keep thinking, wow, cannot believe we have not done that game. Well, it, yeah, you, you guys will figure it out. You're, I hope so. <clears throat> it, it'll, it'll happen. And I, I'm pretty sure... Yeah, the the way that you said it, it just focus on ninety seven. Like I, I don't see why it's absolutely necessary yeah. that you go high school into Advent Children or Crisis Core or like whatever else there is in regards to this. Here, it, it's just it's it's the only way that you can do it in a sensical and reasonable yeah. way. I think yeah. we may tackle those things on their own individually later, sure. yeah. right? But for the yeah. game itself, man. But even even with just the game itself, like. Like even with like Genova and with the ancients and there's so much like there's a lot of Gnosticism. <laughs> there's so much stuff going on there that we're it's gonna be like Xenogears again. And this is the funny thing is that, that Xenogears podcast, man. What is it? Twenty one episodes and each yep. back then we yeah. were doing like three hour episodes. So you know when we're doing our more one and a half to maybe two hour episodes, um, that's like thirty episodes. And that was Xenogears, you know. And mm -hmm. Final Fantasy seven maybe it wouldn't be quite as bad as Xenogears, but. It could be. It could be if I, they wanted it to be. Yeah, I get it. And like I know how much it means to you and yeah. Mike and you want to be like as thorough. It's almost like we're too scared. We're too scared to do it. Yeah, it's I sort of felt the same way when I was doing my retrospectives on Metal Gear uh, on my channel. Yeah. Like, I just that that Final Fantasy to you guys is like Metal Gear to yeah. me. It's the blood oh, that runs really? through my brains. It's the air that I breathe. And if I don't <laughs> do right by it, I, I feel like I made an affront against God right. or something. So I, I get it. I get and, it. And with the podcast, I almost feel like it's like one and done, you know? Like once, we, once we've done Xenogears, you know, there's probably another five episodes worth of content that I want sure. to talk about about Xenogears. But it's over. We already did it. And it's out there. And, and, and we did it. And once you do it, then it's done. Then it's over, you know? And yeah. that's life, you know? You just got to move on and find something else cool to do. You know, there's tons of tons of dope games out there. But, um, like, I don't... It, this, is a, this is a thing about me, famously. I um, don't finish games. I have a hard time finishing games, I guess, on my own. Yeah. I'll do it for the podcast, you know? Uh, but when I play a game on my own, I come to the very end of the game, and I kind of... I just slowly lose the will to keep playing. And it's partly because I don't want it to be over. Mm. And... Once we do a podcast, there's a part of me that's like, wow, I can't believe it. We did it. We tackled the podcast. We did it. But there's another part of me that's like, man, it's over. That's so sad. Yeah. Like, I loved, I almost wish we could just do Xenogears for three years straight and just never Dude, stop talking about Xenogears. Yeah, I know. That's, it's like, it's <laughs> it, like, for me, I wish I could do videos on Metal Gear all the time, but there's yeah. only so much that you can do. That's the way, that's, that's the sacrifice that you make when you do this for YouTube. Right. You know, like, I can't play silent Hill all the time i can't play persona all the time <laughs> and then once you're done talking about it like what's the likelihood that you're gonna be able to go back to it and really enjoy it and yeah yeah it's just the way it works but you, you know. mentioned persona 3 but are there games that you just are you the kind of person that can get a high level of enjoyment over replaying the same material over and over oh <laughs> me too dude. 
<laughs> Dude, Metal Gear Solid 2 is my all-time favorite game. How I've played times? that game a hundred times. Are you serious? I, I swear <laughs> I to God. I don't think I've played anything a hundred times. A uh, hundred times. Wow. Yeah, probably upwards of that. And it's not that high a number for all the other ones, but like yeah. Metal Gear Solid 1, I probably played like 50 times. Oh, my God. Uh, F- Metal Gear Solid 4, like... 30 times um Holy yeah it's cow, man dude that, that that's, that's awesome what, like i yeah well one symptom of autism is the tendency to hyper fixate on things of extreme interest to you oh okay that's what okay, metal gear solid sense. is to me so and metal gear solid 2 i could pick up that game any day and still extract as much enjoyment out of it as i did when i played it for the first time when i was 10 see that was my other question do you still get that and that's wild that's more or less lord of the rings for me i read the books again this year and mm-hmm. I, I'm just shocked at how much material, new material that I never noticed before is in there. Because like people yeah. always say, oh, I can always notice something new. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm noticing like a thousand things new. And I've read this book 20 times, you know, it's just, it, it's unbelievable. It, it, it depends on the property. You know, some properties I think are deeper than others, but for Metal Gear at least, absolutely. But, and that's Metal yeah, Gear 2 uh, you're talking about? Oh, Metal Gear Solid 2, yeah, two, absolutely. Because we'll be playing that this year. It's coming, uh, <laughs> dog. If you uh, if you need a guru who understands that game inside out and backwards, if you need a guy that is more familiar with that game than he is with the roof of his own <laughs> mouth, you should probably bring, <laughs> should probably bring him on the podcast. Well, I would love to. You're always invited. Sweet, thanks, uh, brother. All right. Well, thank you, Max. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I, I hope uh, I, I hope this was fun, and I can't wait to get back into Planescape Torment with you. Yeah, me too, man. Thanks so much for having me. All right. See you, Max.